Hi, I'm Ted Price from Insomniac Games. On today's episode of the Game Maker's Notebook, I got to hang out with someone I've had the pleasure of knowing for many, many years, Marcus Smith. Marcus is a teammate of mine at Insomniac Games and the creative director on Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart. Marcus and I had a lot of fun going back in time and talking about his experiences on Resistance Fall of Man and Sunset Overdrive. But Marcus also shared some of the challenges and tough decisions he and the team tackled on the newest Ratchet & Clank. And for those who want to know more about what it's like to be a creative director, Marcus shares his philosophy on how to build consensus and foster collaboration on big, complex projects. Please join us. Welcome to The Game Maker's Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Maker's Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Marcus. Hello, Ted. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Uh, this is a middle-of-the-day reprieve where we get to talk about something other than work. This is great. Yeah, well, it's 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 weird that you know you and I haven't talked very frequently, but just joking for everybody on the podcast. Uh, Marcus and I have known each other for a long, long time. Yeah, it's it's been a while. I've been at Insomniac for s- over sixteen years now. Yeah, and in- Insomniac adjacent for probably five years before that. So it's been a while. That is that's that's crazy. Well, it is. It's really awesome to have you on the show because y- we've you've worked on some massive games over your career. And I know as a creative director, former project manager, there's a lot that you can share with our audience. And I recently, we haven't had a lot of creative directors on. So I'm pretty pumped to ask you a bunch of questions about your philosophy as a creative director and sort of the things you do. But I want to start. Yeah, I want to start from the beginning. (laughs) Okay. And what was your childhood like in relation to games? Did Did you play a lot of games? You know, I did, and then I didn't. I I grew up in the age of that kind of Atari 2600 era, uh, but my family had an Intellivision, and I'm not exactly sure why that happened, but uh, it was a great system. It broke a few times. I remember driving in to uh, to get it repaired somewhere in Orange County as a kid, uh, but it, it, it was cool. It had that controller that was had a disc on it, and you have to put these little slide things in on a number pad. Um, so I, I played the heck out of that. Uh, I still really enjoyed the Intellivoice that allowed the thing to make sound. And uh, B-17 Bomber was a big favorite of mine. Ah, yeah. And and then we graduated to the Nintendo system. The first one uh, played uh, a lot of that. And then somehow, and I don't know why, uh, I just didn't really play games between then and college. And so I think I missed the entire 16-bit era. And uh, and what brought me back was having a PC and playing Doom and Myst. And those two games were like, oh, my God, you can get so immersive. Like, I remember jumping out of my chair playing Doom in broad daylight in my dormitory. And I was like, man, games can do something really special. And at the time, I was in film school. Uh, and that was kind of the moment when I was like, games uh, are more than just telling a story. They're, you can create entire worlds and and really um, involve the audience in ways that you can't do in film. So I think then and there, my tuition was useless. <laughs> well, that's a that's a big switch, especially if you've made the decision to go to film school. I mean, you were in Cal yeah. Arts yeah. in gorgeous Santa Clarita, <laughs> California, which we call Awesome Town. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> which happens to be right down the street from me. But uh, that that's an awesome school. And so yeah. was there a moment, a specific moment where you made that switch? I, I feel like there was, I was at the time I was a, a video TA. So I was getting paid like $15 an hour to go help uh, underclassmen figure out how to use telecine machines and blue screens in our TV studio. Um, and I, I had a gap in between when I had to show up for work and, and my, my previous class. So I'd go to the library and just kind of sat around in a computer lab and started playing Myst. And I can't tell you how many times I ended up being late for my TA ship because I would just get engrossed. And, and you know, that, that thing was just authored in like HyperCard on, on an old Macintosh system. It was all just a series of, 
of moving pictures, as it were. Uh, but it was all still screen and it was all point and click. And uh, it was really immersive. So I think that was the point where I started kind of looking around to say, you know, is that even a possibility? Hmm. And uh, there was this very strange day where I was about to graduate and I didn't have a place to live or a job, any job prospects. And within a 15 minute span, I received a phone call from my then girlfriend saying she found a condo out in Val Verde. So I had a place to live. <laughs> and then and then like 15 minutes later, I heard from a guy that um, worked at a small edutainment company called Knowledge Adventure uh, that were up in La Crescenta at the time. And he said, hey, we're embarking on uh, doing a film related video game. And we're wondering if you'd like to come and just be a PA. It's just really you're just going to be there for the live action shoot. Uh, and, and you've got, you've got a film degree, so why not? And, uh, it was, a, it was something, uh, which was more than I had before. So I went and did that and, um, it was great because it was, it was for Steven Spielberg's director's chair, which was a game co-created by knowledge adventure and Amblin entertainment. And it allowed me to see the inner workings of software development. Uh, I, I started meeting everybody on the software team. And that's where it really gelled, where I think my personality and my interests just clicked with game developers. That mm -hmm. um, These were all people that were more kindred spirits than being on the film shoot. I mean, the film shoot is just that Hollywood uh, machine where being a, 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 I think actually somebody, one of the producers asked me to get him a coffee and I... I, I wasn't supposed to be doing that, but I'm also a production assistant, so I kind of would need to. But I was so young and, and kind of headstrong, I just left the set. Oh. And the fact that I didn't get fired, I have no idea how that happened. But uh, but yeah, I, I, I basically immersed myself into the development of that game. Anytime anyone needed anything, I would jump in. And I learned so much because just by having a willingness willingness to do the really tedious things. And uh, that that's where I developed uh, a sense of of how games are made and um, how I could maybe move forward with that. Well, that was absolutely the, the early days, the wild west of games, right? That's right. Yeah. And you then transitioned into making I guess, more, more complex games, games that were a little bit larger in scope. What was yeah. that like? Um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the quickest of moment. Actually, I'm going to use this opportunity to embarrass you with a story. And this story is while I was at Knowledge Knowledge Adventure, pardon me, Knowledge Adventure, I worked with a guy whose name was Mark Smith, very similar to my name. And and um, and that's why I remember it. But I had told him how much I loved Spyro because Spyro the Dragon had recently come out. Uh, it was the only game my 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 now wife, then girlfriend um, wanted me to play because it was gorgeous. It, man, that glide mechanic is still the best thing out there. Uh it was so fun. The soundtrack, that Stuart Copeland soundtrack was just so nice. We, we played it all the time. And I just happened to tell him this. And a few weeks later, he comes up to me and he's like, hey, I was at a party. And I met the president of Insomniac Games who made that game Spyro the Dragon. And here's, the, his, here's Ted Price's email. And so <laughs> I went home and I, I wrote an email to Ted Price saying, I'm a designer. I work at this company. I'd love to come work there crickets never heard back from this guy whoever whoever this i'm sure nothing ever amounted to that guy but still um i, I feel terrible you shouldn't because at the time I, I think about it now and and uh i really do think that people who are successful especially at insomniac are people who have had bad working experiences first that they don't come in thinking you know first job syndrome or whatever I worked at some really bad jobs in between then. And uh, I used to work with a, a, a boss who used to lean over my shoulder on his way out of the office on Friday and say, you know, if you screw that up, whatever it was I was working on, you're going to be fired. <laughs> and he wasn't joking. He really wasn't was, joking? I think back on it, and I think he was. I think it was just a really ham-fisted way for him to try to, like, talk to the young kid or whatever. But I don't, what, what that tells me is he was so tone deaf to our experience level differences, right? Like nowadays I think about it and I think about people coming into the industry. What a terrible thing to say. Like that's a, such oh, a yeah. bad joke. First of all, not motivating at all. By the third time he said that I was begging him to fire me. Um, but, but also just like, let's be very careful about how we treat people who are new to the industry because they take it differently. Right. I agree. You know, it's funny. I'm sure everybody who's listening thinks of office space or many people think of office totally. space, right? And of course, that was a satirical take on 
office politics and office structure. But I, having watched that movie, I thought to myself frequently, did I say those things? I probably did. At some point. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you mention that because when that movie came out, I was working at a dot com and at a really, really horrible job, like getting physically ill before going to work kind of bad. And that movie came out and I did not find it funny at all because I was kind of living that, that whole experience. So I, it took me a few years to be able to really appreciate the genius of that movie because I was, I was a little too close to it. Well, it's, it, it, I, I imagine it helped change office culture a bit. Right. It was a mirror for so. a lot of people, probably. I, I hope so. I have the I have a feeling because I did work with a lot of people who like that, they didn't get they didn't get the problem. They were they I don't think they understood that as a as a life lesson. But not whatever the case may be, my my next steps from there uh, at that terrible dot com dot com was I worked with a programmer and we used to just kind of like get together and complain about everything as you do in bad work work environments. And um, I, once again, I mentioned my love of Spyro. I think uh, Spyro 2 had come out by that point. Maybe okay. Spyro 3 was being worked on. And she said, oh, hey, I know a guy named Michael John who worked on that game. And it ended up being Michael John who worked at uh, um, Cerny Games mm -hmm. downstairs. And he had worked on the first Spyro games with you guys. And so I, I just went to lunch with him and a few months later, he mentioned that they were thinking about hiring and, and he, they gave me a test and uh, it worked out well. It was a design test and it worked out well. And I ended up moving in downstairs from you guys uh, yeah. at, at Barham back in the old studio. And uh, that's kind of how I got my foot in the door was working for Mark. And, and uh, we didn't work on, I think Mark worked on the, the Insomniac games and MJ and I would go work on all the projects that were in trouble. So, <laughs> well, I, I remember also you had, I think you were working on a new IP, something that was really cool. And, That's right. and I, unfortunately it never saw the light of day, but I remember seeing concepts and going, that's going to be a fun game. Yeah, that was heartbreaking. There were, there were actually a couple, uh, really unique IPs that we were working on, uh, with different companies and almost always, uh, well, for, for my part, anyways, they, they always got canceled or didn't move forward because of things that were so far out of our hands. It yeah. was, you know, thir third parties who weren't getting their, their um, compensation from their publishers or things like that. So it was pretty heartbreaking. And, and when I made the transition to come over to Insomniac, which again was, uh, I think you came and told us that there were some openings uh, mm -hmm. because, because our, we were shutting the doors of yeah. a small company next door. And, um, there were a few different things, and and what I ended up applying for was uh, being a project manager on an unannounced game, which ended up being very different than what I was expecting. I, I thought I thought this was going to be another Ratchet or Spyro type thing, and it ended up being uh, Resistance Fall of Man, which was a PS3 launch title, and the most exciting times I think of my professional career that there were so many of my career bucket list items. Uh, up for grab, including launch title, you know, putting out a new IP, something had that had a lot of potential to be a big hit. Um, well, and a first person exciting. shooter. I mean, yeah. I, mean I think it's, it's great yeah. that you mentioned Doom because we were at Insomniac at the time, we were kind of going back to our roots and Doom was the inspiration for our very first game, Disruptor. Yeah. And we, we sort of came full circle with Resistance. But when you joined, Resistance was still, if, as I recall, really, really early. I mean, it didn't resemble yeah. anything uh, like the final product, right? Yeah, that's right. When I when I joined, it was more of a space opera. I think yeah. there was, uh, you, you guys had a diorama set up where you were fighting space lizards and yep. uh, you were more uh, space marine. There was a three-part story treatment out there. Um, and I think when I joined, that, that had kind of gone by the wayside and you guys were working on it more of a, more as a, um, alternate history sort of world war one era. That's right. Yep. And so everything was very steampunky mechs and everything. And, and that's where I jumped in. And then like two weeks later, we were post-world war two, almost to Korean war. Right. Type, type time period. So there was a lot, a lot of changing happening on that game. Well, what we needed and what was great was that as project manager, your job was partially to keep everybody sane 
you know, and make order out of this chaos, which was the creative process at the time. Yeah. And I remember just being so thankful that you had, you were there, your calm demeanor really offset <laughs> some of the nuttiness happening mostly because of me on the creative side. And it, and it, and it helped us take that game from that sort of weird amorphous R and D phase to something that we knew could eventually ship with the yeah. launch of the PlayStation three. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that. I'm not sure in retrospect, how much I, I had, uh, had to the success or failure of that project other than holy cow we shipped that game can you believe that <laughs> like that was that, thinking back on that launch of the ps3 how many games were announced that didn't make it to ship and we were like a very small handful and i remember specifically a particular winter where we got the game running from a pc engine uh running on the old ceb kits that were the big uh, silver ones that sounded like jet airplanes yeah and 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 I think we came in the next year and we showed everybody at Sony and they were like, "You're the only games running right now that that we had we had made that leap," and that was that was really exciting because that was a lot of hard work by a lot of a lot of people, but it paid off. It, in it, you're right, it did, and it was actually it was really really touch and go. I, I definitely I'm sure you remember the the yeah. the few weeks before launch where. <laughs> I, I, am I wrong? This we our four our, our stalkers our four legged mechs. Yeah, I don't think they were working. I about think two or three weeks before launch, there, really? there was there was there was a uh, a particular meeting that I remember. We ran through and literally nothing worked except for the drop ship uh, troop carriers. Yeah, they worked okay, and then we ended up not even really using them That's in right. the final project. But everything was broken. It was just a wreck. And uh, yeah. And again, yeah, everybody knuckled down and, and really fought for it, and we were able to get it out the door. And um, I don't know if, if even you remember this or if I bubbled it up, but we almost didn't ship because an environment artist had put in a picture of the Beatles on a poster in that was hadn't been seen. You kind of had to like get in a weird position to see it, but um, it was just one of those things where their excuse was, I Googled an image. I just wanted a poster on the wall, and he didn't realize it was like, the old Beatles when they were, they were young and playing in Germany. So that kind of thing can really haunt you. And that's, that's why uh, I think here, especially we're very aware of the legal problems we can all get into. Well, that's actually, it's a good example of what project managers have to deal with. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, in fact, it might be useful for you to describe to people you know, what at Insomniac, at least what project managers do. I mean, they're, they juggle flaming cats. It's, uh, uh, you know, it, it's funny. I used to say the thing that I did the most as a project manager was just getting two people who should be talking to each other, talking to each other. That so often we get so caught up in what we're doing at our desk and focused on other things that we don't just have those conversations uh, to figure out what are we trying to get done? Are we hitting our, 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 our goals? Is there a better way to do it? Um, and so, you know, project management goes it runs the gamut from you are the person who is overseeing the overall schedule you're the person who's working with the publisher liaisons to make sure that all the the moving parts are in order that we're going to be hitting our ship dates that we're going to have qa working on the project at the correct time um, we have all of the legal checks that we just mentioned so that uh, anything that possibly could get flagged down the road needs to get through uh, legal department um, who are very much not wanting to get sued yeah. And, uh, and sometimes you're just the shoulder to cry on. I can't, re I can't tell you how many times it was people taking me out on the balcony. I always talked about balcony chats. Uh, I, it was always nerve wracking cause I thought it was going to be people telling me they were quitting. Um, <laughs> segueing a little bit, you're talking about how we were transitioning. I think Insomniac had only had one project manager before me and that right. was John Fiorito who had just come over from being art director, long time art director. Yeah. And it was at a period when we actually did have people quit over uh, the company becoming too corporate because yeah, we had that. managers now. <laughs> we had we had managers, we had departments. We actually put departments in place because yep. prior to that, it had just been super flat hierarchy. And unfortunately, yeah. it meant that everything was going through me and right. I was the bottleneck for pretty much and, and the cause of those problems. <laughs> Well, I didn't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but but you're right. It was a yeah. it was a big period of transition because at that point games were getting more complex. I mean, games have always been getting more complex, but at that point we had sort of hit a critical mass. I think. With- yeah, and I think you guys had had grown. I mean, when we moved into the new building there in Burbank, um, I feel like you guys had gone from around forty people mm-hmm. to over a hundred in just a few months. That's right. So it's really difficult uh, to make sure that everybody is marching to the same rhythm when there are that many people, when there is no hierarchy, you have people kind of going all over the place willy nilly. So my, my job coming in was, uh, first of all, to create a, an entire project schedule and then to realize that it was already out of date by the time I finished it two days later um, and how futile that is. And so we, we started working on much more of a um, by a milestone hmm. type type schedule that we still kind of use where it's not, it's not quite agile development, but it's um, you keep things a little tighter and, and you work with small groups and try to accomplish things. Uh, but it was just, it was starting to get too big for one person. And so luckily I did get a, a couple assistant project managers to help out to, to own specific things like cinematics is usually always a beast. Um, there, there's always some projects that, that are parts of the project that really need a lot more close eyes and scrutiny. So uh, I was happy that's to a, help. Yeah, that's a really good point. Cinematics is something that I think that from an outside perspective feels sort of like, ah, oh, it's, it's just sort of an extra part of the game. And yeah. you know, the real, the really challenging part is figuring out gameplay. But you're right. Oh, yeah. Cinematics are a beast because it is it takes a lot of people inside and outside yeah. the company to deliver them. That's right. It is. It is super complicated. I mean, it's in a lot of ways, we're making feature films and yeah. we're doing them inside of this interactive art. And it is uh, an amazing amount of work. And as the fidelity of our games gets more and more um, visually spectacular, it just is going to become more of a blur between what we're doing in real time and what other companies are are, are spending a lot of time and effort rendering uh, at a much slower rate than us. Uh, I think we're that, pretty close to being there. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, it's I, I mean, clearly we aren't yet photo real. Uh, yeah, n- except in maybe very limited circumstances within games. But, you know, by by whatever the next generation is, we should be pretty darn yeah. close. All the Yeah. Time. And, I, and I think it depends greatly on your expertise. I think a lot of people out there, a lot of game players even in the age of uh, PS3, we're like, it can't get any better than this. It's amazing. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I remember watching a, a Dreamcast football game and I had to stop and go, is that a video? That's insane. And I look at it now and I'm <laughs> so embarrassed. <laughs> I know. Well, you, so, so what's awesome is that you came in and you helped sort of you helped ship two massive games, yeah. Resistance 1 and Resistance 2. And then you made the That's transition right. to Creative Director yeah. on Resistance 3. And so at some point, had you had you looked at what Creative Directors were doing and going, yeah, you know, that seems to fit me better? Uh, well, it's funny. I didn't. I wasn't really sure what a Creative Director was. And again, mm-hmm. Insomniac, uh, you know, you had always been in charge of, of games and and Brian Hastings at certain points and Brian Algeyer had been sort of the first designated creative director, but I don't know that I knew exactly what I was getting into. I remember you called me into your office and just said, hey, how would you like to get back on the creative side? Uh, Because my background is design. Um, And so I I was very happy at at the promise for that. And, um, And then it was just kind of trial by fire to figure out what that means. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I leaned on you a lot to figure out what that means and, and how to do a good job. Um, and, and I, I had, had the luxury. Clue, so I was just basically oh, just please, giving you a bunch of bad information. You, you, I, I would say I had the luxury of not also running a giant studio at the same time. That that, uh, that uh, balance is something I still don't understand how you were able to do because it, it's a full-time job. You live and breathe these games as creative director, especially back then when games were large and you were kind of alone. And uh, I, I remember lots and lots of times it came down to how do we get Ted's time and be most efficient? How do we move forward? And it was walk arounds. It was, you know, it was, it was kind of schedule your time and say, we're going to go talk to the environment artist or we're going to talk to the, the uh, uh, character artist. And you would just look at everything, give feedback, and and uh, other people like Chad Desern was the lead environment guy. He would explain what was happening, where we were going from there. Um, 
but I will say there is a very different feedback loop between you and anybody on the team versus any of us and everybody on the team, which is when Ted Price speaks, he is the owner of the company and he's signing our checks and we are absolutely going to do that. And, and then when I would come up and say, hey, you think you can make that a little more purple? They'd be like, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I see it a little differently. but I think I'm it's, sure. <laughs> I mean, what I recall most was making people really upset. I would make people oh. upset because especially, and you mentioned Chad, yeah. right? The people who were in charge of various aspects of the game would have to deal with the debris yeah. I left in my wake and not even realizing it by saying, oh, yeah. hey, you know, I was getting frustrated playing this test level the other day and boy it'd be cool if it, whatever abc yeah and then they do it yeah. and my in my head i'm going yeah why don't you this maybe you could try some stuff but i'm not telling you to do this and then yeah and then the and then the <laughs> director of gameplay or or art director would come to me and say do you know what you just did you yes. just set us back a month right. by your comment <laughs> so uh what was awesome marcus yeah. is that yeah. You and, and I think very appropriately, creative directors uh, are all about collaboration and, and ensuring that the team knows they're being listened to and you're encouraging ideas and encouraging people to experiment. But you're not saying my way or the highway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, and that, I mean, that's your demeanor in general. That's what how you. I, yeah. Run. Although I, I will say I, I did slip into a lot of that. I think when I was more inexperienced, I did focus more on the details. And I think it, it's it's a, a lesson, a couple of lessons in there. One is speaking to what you just talked about. I do remember going into your office so livid because you had had a conversation with with someone and it had, it had taken a level we were working with just completely off the rails. And I had it in my mind that you were undercutting because you didn't think that I was doing a good job or something because you fill in the yeah. gaps when you don't know. Right. So, and then I went and I, I, I complained to you loudly and probably a little tearfully and you, you, uh, you calmed me down and you explained the situation that it had been a completely innocuous conversation where you just happened to talk to somebody. And um, so that's a huge lesson is don't assume what the other person is thinking because we do it all the time right. and it always gets us into trouble. Just go have a conversation. And I'm super antisocial, anxiety ridden. I don't like conversations, but I've become better at, at doing that, talking to anyone, even even if they are particularly difficult personalities. Um, and, and that's a yeah. that's a fantastic skill, right? I mean, would you say that's almost a requirement for a, a creative director? Yeah, yeah, I, I would. I mean, I, I hear the stories about games done in the past, and I and that's much more of an auteur you know, this is a director and th this person. But I think that the games that come out of that, they have a very unique point of view, but they lack a lot of the um, the things that people with different points of view can bring together that, that doesn't happen elsewhere. Um, I, I, I think a lot back to, um, uh, we had Joe Rohde come and talk at some point, the right. Disney Imagineer, and he had this great example. And he said, as a director, you are basically just telling people, we are driving to Santa Monica. I don't want to give you road by or street by street directions because things change all the time. I could tell you to turn left here and there's a car accident. You need to plot that course. You just need to know we're headed to Santa Monica. And my job as a director is if I see you driving to El Paso, it's course correction time. Yeah. You know, you really want to rely on the people that you are uh, you are directing. And the biggest thing to that is making sure that you have a very clear objective and set of, of uh, design to go to. So that people know, okay, we're going to Santa Monica, and they know when they're not going to Santa Monica. And I thought that was a great analogy. Had had you already been heading down that path? Because he he came no. a few years ago, and no. Well, yeah, yeah, yes, I, I think so. I think I think uh, you know his his analogy was working on um, Animal Kingdom in Florida. He doesn't care what color the coral is, and right. and and I that that I think I I can relate to a lot. You get you get pulled into all these all this minutia. And it's not worth your time. And you're not the expert. Like somebody else should be able to do that uh, way better. But you should define what is being made so that somebody could make a better color choice. Uh, and I, I think that's what we do. I, I think working on Resistance 3 was a great example of um, why pillars mm -hmm. or containers are very beneficial. And it was working with you because... I'm very bad at that, as it turns out. And and what we had come up with resist, with Resistance 3 was heroic survival in a brutal world. 
right. which, which in and of itself doesn't mean a whole lot. But when you break it down and you start saying, okay, is what we're presenting showing off a brutal world? Is it showing off heroism? Uh, and you can start breaking it down into those containers. And all of a sudden you have a very, really good tool to make decisions by. Because before that and without that, all we really have is our own opinions. And, and you can't craft something with cohesion if you're just saying, yeah, it seemed cool. <laughs> totally. It's, just, it's such a great point. And it, I remember you referencing the, that pillar frequently, and it took, it took the emotion out of a lot of the yeah. discussions. I mean, Absolutely. nobody, people rarely felt like you were saying, you just suck. <laughs> right. It was right. It's more about does it fit? Does it fit yeah. with the vision of the game? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And 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 that that is invaluable. I will, I will say that that's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned uh, in being a better creative director. And everything after that is basically interacting with human beings and respecting everybody's time and, and opinions. Yeah. You know? Well, you took you took that in a big way right on to Sunset Overdrive after <laughs> after resistance and. That game had such a fascinating beginning. So can you yeah. talk a little bit about how, how the game was born? Yeah, so uh, Drew Murray was the lead designer of Resistance 3 uh, while I was creative director, and he and I worked together really, really well. Um, and at some point, he was designated to be creative director of a different project, or actually of that project, and I was designated to be on something else. Um, but on in our spare time, we had been working together on a game idea. And that was basically inspired by I Am Legend, the, the novel, not the, not the movie. Um, and it, it basically focused around surviving, uh, sur- scavenging by day, defending at night. And, and we thought, wow, what a great thing. And at, at the time, and I think this reflects a lot of our own personalities, Resistance 3 is dire. And it's about family and about a father who's trying to do his best for his kid. Both Drew and I were expecting our first kids during that time. So I think there was a lot of psychological elements there that we could tie together. Um, it, when Sunset started and we were first doing ideation on that idea, it was more dire. It was more post-apocalyptic and a little bit more true to that um, that that novel. Uh, and at some point, I remember we had a meeting where we just we were looking at each other saying, is Insomniac the company to make this game? Because it it honestly seemed a little bit like a Fallout feeling or something, and 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 that's not really what this company does well. And uh, so I I had the inspiration to do a pitch to Drew that was basically we're going to take the idea of the game, but we're going to turn it on its head, and it's going to be about uh, fun in the end times. And you and I. We love punk rock music. We love weird masks. We love, you know, just these weird art influences and everything. We're just going to put those all together into a big jumble. And it's going to be centered around this idea of fun in the end times or the rock and roll end times. If you want to talk about uh, how messages can go bad, it it, it turns out everyone's idea of rock and roll is different. And so when when I say it, uh, I was thinking more of the posturing. You know, I want to see. I want to see Keith Richards swagger and I want to see Iggy pop in his, in his iconic stances. And that's how the game is going to be presented. And then other people were like, okay, it's going to be a rhythm game. We're going to have a rock and roll. We're going to be playing air guitar. Uh, so yeah. So that game, uh, we pitched it to, to you and, and Brian and Al, uh, our, our inner circle. And, uh, and there, we 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 were so naive. We we thought, you know, what? We're not going to tell you anything about a story or even what this game gameplay is about because we just want you to absorb the ideas, man. And <laughs> and we we presented this completely like insane list of stuff, and 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 then everybody was just kind of like, okay, well. What's the game? What's the story? What's the so we, we needed to take a, cu- a couple cracks at that one, uh, but eventually we we were able to pitch it to a publisher who decided to roll with it. Well, it was what was awesome was that you pitched it to I think almost every single person in the company, and that's right. And you got a lot of feedback from from everybody, and you were able to refine the pitch into something that I thought was completely compelling. And so we went up to Microsoft. <laughs> Uh, as one of our one of the publishers we were pitching, <laughs> yeah. and that day, 
Well, I will never forget that day because of Drew's how how you guys pitched it. You, I mean, you okay. can describe it. Okay, hold on though. If we're going to tell the story correctly, it it goes back a little bit further, which is we were getting ready for that pitch when I got a phone call from you that you were at a VGA award. Uh, it, or a it was actually it was a G four it was a G four show uh, episode. G, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. 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 But it was like in December. It was. It was like yeah. it was coming up uh, to when we were supposed to pitch, and. You said, hey, I'm sitting here watching Cliff Blazinski pitch this game called Fortnite. And people have to remember, Fortnite was not what it is. You know, it, it was like six years in development. It was a long time. But when he originally pitched it and put the first trailer out, it used all the same influences. It was, it was talking about scavenging by day, defending by night. It had a tower defense system. It even talked about how the gorillas video that inspired us so much internally also inspired it. Um, so we had to slam the brakes and we almost didn't do Sunset Overdrive because we didn't know. We knew we were pitching for Microsoft. We knew that Microsoft had a had a um, association with Epic. We didn't know what was going on. But we slammed the brakes on and immediately turned to the team and said, plan B, guys, let's do it. And uh, at, at the time, uh, there were a lot of people who loved the game Phantom Dust uh, from, from um, Xbox and... Um, we basically put together a pitch called Birthright that was magic dueling and fighting. Uh, and we pitched that and we worked on that for a few months, for about three months. We, we had prototypes up. We were doing multiplayer magic fights and everything and uh, against, you know, really crude art. Um, but I think that you recognize that Drew and I, our heart wasn't quite in that game as much as it had been in the other one. So, uh, Against all better judgment, you said, "Hey, how'd you like to go?" <laughs> Instead of saying, "Here's here's what we've got so far," let's just do a clean slate and say we like this better. And uh, to their credit, they said, "Okay, we'll we'll give a listen." But yeah, we we flew up to Microsoft. So against that background, this is already unusual. We we already basically have a, a deal to work on this other game, and here these yahoos are coming to pitch an entirely different game. But we wanted to make sure that it it we hit a home run with it. So we went all out. We, uh, we started the meeting out with uh, MC fives, kick out the jams, which starts out with a very famous uh, vulgar intro only to learn later that one of the executives in the room deplores swearing. So that was a good start. Uh, <laughs> and then we, we walked our way through the game. We tried to make it as uh, demonstrable as possible. And it ends with drew explaining what combat at a night defense would be like, and acting it out. So he's getting surrounded by OD and it drew himself, got up on a chair and was shooting down recklessly at, at, at everything around him. And it was just such a great theatrical moment that I, I couldn't tell if it was going to be a huge success or an unbelievable failure, but uh, all, all credit to drew for pulling that one off. That was really amazing. I, I will say, I, I remember just sort of, you know, dreading and, and 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 gleefully anticipating that moment at the same time and wondering what people how people would react if they just be shocked into silence yeah. or not but Drew, it was awesome because both of you guys are so animated and that's what it took to sort of explain what this game was and the energy that comes along with being a part of Sunset City and and doing all the things you do uh, and it, yeah, it, it worked it worked yeah so some sometimes passion trumps uh logic honestly and I, I think we, as as people who work in the entertainment industry, sometimes you need that. Yeah. yeah. That that is the difference between taking an idea, and and you know making it into something amazing. Is somebody needs to own it, love it, and really try to push for it. Uh, but they also have to be willing to kill it if it's not working. And I think that 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 is something we all suffer from a lot: is not recognizing when an idea is not working, and uh, and having the will to kill. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. I think yeah. it's a great topic. So as creative director, that is the, the big decisions are really in front of you, right? They come to you yeah. and people expect you to be decisive and, and do what's best for the game. So how yeah. do you make those decisions? Well, again, going back to having those pillars is hugely important. And so an example in Sunset Overdrive was one of our pillars was uh, fast-paced, high action. 
that it was a game that was meant to be flying around the world. So whenever somebody came in with a, a really unique crafting pitch that involved you sitting in a menu and making selections, it's really easy to say that's not high action fast, you know. So that that goes a long way. And like you say, it takes the emotion out of it and it, it's easy. Um Gray areas are a lot harder and, and it really comes down to, I, you know, I, I think that was the biggest difference between you and I and the way that we made decisions is you are very decisive and I am someone who wants to see all the angles. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of, I, I think it's, it's difficult in that way to kind of, you need to pull yourself out. But a lot of times all that means is I need to be open with, I need to think about this more. I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not making a decision right now. I will, I will prioritize this so it's not going to be a bottleneck for anybody else, but I really need to think about it from all the angles. And all the angles sometimes come down to, you know, putting my PM hat on and saying, this idea is going to come at the cost of these other things. And those other things add up to something greater than what we're getting from this. So sometimes it comes down to that. Um, some, sometimes people talk you into it and you've got a great idea that you didn't think was going to work. And that, that's awesome, too. Do you ever find that you need to explain your thought process to others so they're not looking at you and going, "Hey, why aren't you why aren't you just telling me yes yeah. or no right now?" Yeah, absolutely. I right. again, it's 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 being transparent and mm -hmm. and being able to communicate to people oftentimes is explaining what's happening so they're not just sitting in silence wondering what's going on. Yeah. Um, I a big problem that I had always had when I was younger was I didn't want to seem like the dumb guy. Hmm. And when I came into Insomniac, especially because you guys had such a track record and it's really intimidating to sit in a room with Al Hastings. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what I learned was asking the dumb guy questions is is so important because half the time people just aren't thinking about that. And so you ask a question and it's such a relief to see Al kind of do a thought process and go, OK, yeah, there's some legitimacy into what you're asking. And it happens all the time. So now I don't care if people think I'm an idiot. I just want us to make great games. And, you know, that, that that's a big thing to get past your ego to kind of to kind of like, I'll just be ignorant here. I, but I need to know what this answer is. And if they don't have it, then that's a problem. Well, that's a great, great point. It's a great technique, too, because I, I feel like I, if, if you ask a question like that, I'm usually thinking I was thinking that, but I just didn't have the guts to ask it or. You know, yeah. and, and probably half the people or more in the room are thinking, thank God somebody actually raised their hand and 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 asked for better explanations. Yeah. Well, and the flip side is sometimes it is a dumb question and people are like rolling their eyes and you just go, oh, I tried. It's, <laughs> you sense. only hit the shots you take. <laughs> and it, but it, you know what? As the, I guess on the flip side, too, yeah. it makes leaders more human because totally. I mean, all of us are struggling with the same challenges every single day. And usually it's trying, it goes back to our very, you know, we said at the very beginning is creating order out of chaos, right? These games yep. are just a, a, a goulash of amazing, cool ideas that are all trying to fit together in some fashion. So yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so you, so you need to ask the obvious. Uh, yep. <laughs> well, Sunset for sure. Uh, and I, I could talk for all day on Sunset just because it was, I, <laughs> for me, it was, it was such a wonderful <laughs> experience, but it did take, it did take arguably a long time for order to emerge out of the chaos. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what were some of the most challenging moments for you uh, on that project? I think the tone, the tone was a big one because as creative director, of course, you're expected to just say, here's the tone, go and have people get it. But when you're talking about tone that you can't easily just point at something, um, it's really hard. Mm. And that's, that's what I learned. And, and, mm -hmm. I think it was really helpful when um, Bobby Coddington was was hired on as our lead uh, animator that he was really helpful in pulling up images or footage of things and saying, it's not this, because he kept seeing his animators kind of go into using the well of something that wasn't wasn't um, tonally fitting. And, mm -hmm. and it's easy to say what it's not and then also build something up that was it's more like this. So it is more Iggy Pop and 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 less. Uh, back to the future or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, but I, th I think from a studio standpoint, you know, my, my, when I start a game, my strategy is I've seen so many projects die because they're trying to serve too many masters. And so the first thing I do starting a new project is just go and I talk to all the individual um, 
vested interested parties. So mm-hmm. it'll be, I'll, I'll go, you know, obviously to you and, and Al and Brian and, and Chad and John, uh, but also Sony PD, Sony marketing, uh, you know, who, whomever is going to be involved with making and selling this game and saying, what is most important? I want to, I want to clarify that. And, and at the time, uh, I think we were really looking for a critical hit with Sunset. I think it was more of a, you know, we, we, we're kind of in a doldrum a little bit. We want to break things up and, and be different. And so when we were talking about Sunset, it really was how do we become different? We don't want to be, you know, like it was always the worst thing in the world when you, you blood, sweat and tears to make resistance. And then somebody says, oh, it's not Half-Life or, oh, it's not Halo or whatever, because as a first person shooter, you're kind of getting involved in that. So we wanted to make something that was just really different, the kind of the blue ocean philosophy. Uh, and so in order to do that, you don't have those touchstones that you can point to and say, it's definitely this. You have some and you need to pick those carefully. But that was the biggest challenge, um, as well as just working with a different publishing partner. Like yeah. We didn't know how to work with Microsoft at the time. Uh, somebody there had even mentioned it takes about a game and a half for developers to learn how to work with us. Uh, and I, I found that to be fairly, fairly true. Uh, it was a lot like, of great people. A lot of great people. I agree. I mean, I, yeah. I really enjoyed the relationships that we developed with, with their team. And we, we learned a heck of a lot about yeah. organization and uh, accountability because, you know, at that time, we were so used to other ways of working. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was painful at times for sure. Absolutely. And I, I will say that like all these things are, are, are life lessons, growth lessons. And yeah. I, I think that we much needed that organizational kick in the pants yep. to move forward. And I don't think we would have been as successful shipping Spider-Man had it not been for Sunset, Sunset Overdrive. I, I totally agree. And I, I mean, a lot of people do point to the similarities in the mechanics, right? Sure. What we were doing with the grinding and the bouncing and all of the very high velocity acrobatic moves that you have in Sunset and how yeah. they translated to ultimately to Spider-Man. And that is absolutely yeah. true. But there was also the whole city building, world building, yeah. working in an urban environment, which was somewhat new to us. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember pitching to the company and uh, Mike Acton our, was our then head of uh, core technology. And the one thing that he had told me that we would not be doing as an engine was an open world game. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. and I remember pitching to the company and just kind of looking straight at, into him saying, I'm sorry, Mike, but this is an open world game. Uh, <laughs> right. Cause Mike had, Mike had gone around and this is, this is, we, we just for everybody, the view listeners benefit, we had made a shift in our engine technology after yeah. resistance, knowing that we needed to get more modern with our tools. Yep. And Mike and the core team, which is our technology team, had asked almost every person in the company, what do you want to make? What are your plans? Yeah. And that, you, when you're in a creative company and you're asking that question, everybody's going, well, I'd really like to make an RP overhead RPG. It'd be awesome. Yeah. Or, yeah. or a racing game. <laughs> yeah. <so. laughs> yeah. It, it's, again, it's really hard. I, what I really like about the games that we've made while I've been here and, and even as a fan before is there is a through line. I, I truly believe that when you play an Insomniac game, there is there are things that build off of all the others. And I can look yeah. back at every game that I've worked on and the ones that I haven't worked on uh, and I can see that through line. I'm, yeah. I mean, Sunset to Spider-Man is, is pretty clear because it has a lot of similar mechanics and is based on traversal in a way that, that um, really made it make sense. Um, but... If you look at Sunset Overdrive, it's basically a ratchet game, right? Like it's, yeah. it is a different tone. It's a different feel and everything, but it's built off of a lot of the things that hmm. we did. And it's, it's not that we're lazy. <laughs> it's the, the correct solution is there and we've already done it. And so now our challenge always moving forward is how do we break out of this and, and be different, but retain the spirit of what makes Insomniac games great. And I always consider really good controls yeah. uh, and intuitive input to be uh, chief among those. Like even going back to Spyro, I just remember thinking, man, these guys are making Nintendo like games in America. And and what I meant by that was a, a level of polish that if you go back and you look at like the blastos of the world, it just wasn't there. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. I mean, just going all the way back, Mario on the GameCube was a massive inspiration for us. And I remember Brian Hastings 
uh, and Al Hastings playing with just running Mario around in circles in that very first area in yeah. on, with Mario 64, I think it was on the uh-huh. GameCube. And just, we were all sort of going, yeah, that's amazing. How did they make him feel so good yeah. just running in circles? And we need to emulate this in some way. And so Al and Brian put their magic hats on and, and made it happen. Uh, yeah. Oh, and it's crazy. Made it happen with a quadruped. Like yeah, right. Spiral was fun to run around in. I swear if I pitched anything with a quadruped now, the animation department would hang me by the rafters because that's a huge challenge. But man, Spyro had that fun factor. And it yeah. really was. And, and again, the camera was gorgeous. The draw distance was incredible. It just everything about that uh, really felt next level in a way that no other, especially American game companies were doing. So well, that's a, that. Uh, that's that's awesome, and I, I <laughs> that sort of reflects our love, uh, you know, our continual love of platformers and those, you know, and and the very expressive characters, which I think you know leads to Rift Apart, and it's it's certainly worth spending a little time, sure, on please. Rift Apart. And so, how did how did Rift Apart come to be? Well, uh, from my perspective, uh, I was asked if I wanted to head up a new Ratchet game, and and I was fearful. And uh, I think I think Sean McCabe maybe talked to me first about it, and I said I don't think I can do that. I don't I don't I don't know what was happening at the time, but just my my personal life was was bad or something. But I, I just it didn't seem like a good fit. I'd never worked on a ratchet game, uh, and then as months and months went by and it became closer, I called him up and I said I made a huge mistake by telling you I would I didn't want to be involved. Um, I would love to do it, and. Uh, luckily, uh, that, that all worked out. Um, from there, it became that same challenge that I talked about before of what do people need from this game? So talking to marketing and everyone else, it basically came down to this has a great opportunity to show off the hardware. We have, a, we have this new uh, hardware that we don't know much about yet, but you're going you're gonna to be shipping on it. Uh, so that means you also have to come out on time. So sometimes those are diametrically opposed goals. <laughs> and... Uh, and then internally, especially, it was much more about staying true to the franchise. Uh, you know, Ratchet and Clank is coming up on 20 years now, uh, and it's really is one of the few remaining character action platforms of that era that is still uh, not just surviving but thriving. Yeah. And so, staying true to that, but also bringing something new, because the flip side to being around forever is you've done a lot of things, and how do you reinvent yourself? Um, mixed in with all of that was marketing, especially being very vocal to make sure that despite the fact that we have a very long running storyline and we have very dedicated fans, you have to remember that it's been 12 years since Crack and Time came out. That was the last full length Ratchet and Clank game. Um, and if you think that you're just going to pick up on that storyline, you got to remember a lot of people playing this game not only have never played it, but might not even have been born. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so so the trick in that balance of all of those things is to uh, th- this game really has been about threading the needle and the, the needle is shipping on time and making sure you're showing off the hardware and staying true, but bringing something new and bringing new players in, but but also giving longtime fans things to, to root for and cheer. So that was the biggest challenge was, OK, moving forward. How do we do that? Hmm. Um, and. And step one uh, was I got a download, a little bit of a download. I, a few of us did about what the capabilities of PS5 were. And it seems pretty clear that streaming speeds with the SSD were going to be kind of phenomenal <laughs> is one way to look at it. So we decided to really lean into that and say um, streaming is going to be our big thing. And so we started sort of riffing on ideas about almost like stranger things, being able to flip into the upside down world and do things like that. And um, because we had this, I had this chart of all the things we were trying to do, and it looks very much like a yin yang. I, I kind of just went with the idea of duality being the central core. And in order to do almost a, it's a wonderful life storyline where we can bring new players in by, by telling the ratchet and clank story uh, a new by using other characters to do it. Um, that's where the alternate dimension came in. Um, and then as we started to riff on the idea of alternate dimensions, a lot of things come into play. You start being able to say, okay, gameplay mechanics, what can we use dimensionality for? 
Um, and of course, that created this alternate dimension ratchet uh, named Rivet, who I think was probably the, the biggest hill for me to climb internally uh, at first. And mm-hmm. luckily, luckily, that didn't last too, too long. Well, let's we'll talk about that, because that yeah. was a that was a big shift for us uh, to, to introduce a character that was going to be um, at, you know, have equal billing. Uh, with Ratchet, we ne- I don't think we'd ever tried that before, except for maybe, well, gosh, we never tried it before. And, and so what were some of the challenges associated with that decision? I mean, just that, just the anytime you are trying something that you can't look at something and say, hey, this is going to be successful um, mm-hmm. was was challenging. And, and I think there was a lot of hesitancy in creating a different character Mm-hmm. that it would seem like we were undermining our lead characters. This is a Ratchet and Clank game. And my counter argument to all that was, it still is. Rivet is Ratchet from that dimension. And man, talk about uh, <laughs> it's just like having a difficult time wrapping your head around it. I'm sure you remember in yeah. their story treatments for the longest time, her name was Ratchet. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and and every time you talked about Ratchet, the writer would have to put in which one they meant. And it became pretty clear why that wasn't going to work. Uh, uh, but conceptually, it really needed to be that because the story is about a, a universe where Ratchet and Clank never met. There, there, there is a Ratchet who doesn't have a, a Clank. And the fact is, speaking of duality, Ratchet and Clank are the perfect uh, example of duality. They, they have very different personalities. And when left on their own, those personalities can really get them in trouble. Ratchet can be too impetuous and he can get himself in trouble. Clank can almost be paralyzed with too much thought and, and processing. But man, you put them together and they they are they are unlikely heroes who can overcome any odds. And what a great story. Now, how do we tell that story to people who haven't been playing it for 20 years? So that that's where the alternate dimension uh, Ratchet came into play and eventually we were able to tell a story that wasn't so confusing that everybody couldn't remember which dimension they were in at any given time. Well, what were some of the things, that, tricks that you uh, you employed or decisions you made along the way to help simplify the story? Because I do remember yeah. it was early on, we really threw a lot of twists and turns, so many in that it was completely yeah. pretty confusing. I think the biggest... The biggest change to the story that probably had the, the biggest overall effect, and I give uh, uh, Brian Hastings credit, uh, all the credit in the world for this, is when he pitched it to me, I was almost angry at him that he even he even did. But we originally, uh, Ratchet and Rivet ended up interacting with the Dimensionator in their own dimension, separate dimensions, and they were split and separated in those alternate dimensions. So... Ratchet was in Rivets exclusively and Rivet was in Ratchets exclusively. And what that set up was a very difficult to communicate dichotomy where Ratchet is always in Dimension Zulu and 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 uh, Rivet is always in Dimension Alpha. How do you represent that visually? How do you represent that storytelling wise um, without just being totally confusing? So his suggestion that ended up really clarifying things was that Ratchet gets sent to the same dimension. And and all of the same things can happen, but they're separated. And it helped us all along the way because we really didn't have any good way that they could communicate. So we were starting to devise all these uh, even more complicated methodology to allow them to be able to speak and formulate plans and be able to hand off things. And uh, that that was the biggest story streamlining, I think. And, mm-hmm. and, um, and again, an example of creative director is not the one with all of the answers and ideas. They're the one who needs to police those ideas into something that fits the the pillars and goals and ultimately makes a better product. Yeah. What, were you were you worried at points along the way about <laughs> where the game was going, whether we'd actually ship it? And uh, what were some of the, the biggest sort of things that as a as a creative leader on the project you you had to just help yeah. fix? Well, the the, the most Besides challenging the time. I mean, it happens all the time, right? Like we are creative problem solvers. We're collaborative creative problem solvers. And uh, we had been moving along. We had we had stood up the game. We had a, a pretty good demo um, and we delivered it and everybody was feeling pretty good. We worked really hard on it. 
but then we came back from a, a holiday break and we had had everybody play it before we left. And when we got back, uh, I had to stand up in front of the team and explain that it wasn't where it needed to be. It was, it was a fun demo. It just felt like a port. If we went out with, with that level of innovation and showing off what our pillars are, it would have just been met with, eh, it's a, it feels like a port. Um, yeah. So that was the moment where it was stand up in front of the team and say, it's not because you didn't work hard enough. It's because uh, leadership, uh, me included, especially, uh, had been focusing on the wrong things. And while we had lots of plans in the works to kind of move things, we were going to fail if we just continued doing what we had been doing. And we needed to do a uh, slam on the brakes, get everybody to focus on on fixing the problem. And that's where a lot of the innovative things that came out of Rift Apart uh, mechanically and clarification of the story and all of those things uh, happened. And again, very team effort. Uh, Chad Desern helped uh, shepherd that from the executive level and Brian Hastings was super involved. Um, Laura and me really stepped up as the lead writer to um, always have everything in control and be willing to make changes and, and jump. Because at that point, we had a pretty solid macro so we had planets that were under work. So it's, it wasn't just like simplify the story. It's simplify the story that's actually this Jenga tower where every little thing that gets moved affects something else. Um, and it was a huge challenge. And hats off to everybody involved in, in solving those problems because uh, n there, was no, there was not a one person or one solution. It, it always had to come down to a bunch of different people with different points of view getting together and working things out. And that's what this, this game is all about, overcoming your differences and having empathy. And, and in so many ways, I feel like the production mimicked the storyline and, and the lessons that are in that, that game. Could that's great. That's a, that's a really good parallel. I, I just want to go back to that speech yeah. and, and that moment. How did you prepare for that? A lot of throwing up, honestly. Like a lot of, <laughs> I, uh, it was really, it was really bad timing because I, 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 and some of the leads had flown out to North Carolina because we were onboarding um, a lot of the team members that were coming over to help join, uh, who had finished up on Stormland and now were coming over to uh, work on on Ratchet. So it was a message I had to deliver remotely to Burbank, mm. and 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 that is terrible because I really. When you're giving a message like that, it's really important to see into people's eyes to tell who you need to go follow up with, because you can see it when somebody's not into what you're saying. Yeah. And that's when it's really important to go have a balcony talk or have a have a sit down and just say, hey, let's talk through this, because especially people who are young and we do have a lot of new uh, employees who've never experienced a game. They don't understand, like, this is an important step. This is. This isn't a failure. Learning, even if it's through a failure, is still learning. And so we need people to understand that we would rather have them try something and figure out that it's not right and do something else than be gun shy, to be hesitant to move forward. So I never wanted anybody to feel like this was a punitive message. It was more of a, hey, this is we're not there yet, and we and we need to do something drastic uh, to move forward. And yeah, so I, I, I was out in the parking lot in North Carolina kind of rehearsing my lines and trying to formulate what I was going to be saying. And, and of course, it all falls apart as soon as you're up in front of a room full of people, especially when half of them were uh, the people I could actually look into their eyes were just joining the project. They had never done anything on the game. And here I am saying, we failed this milestone. And they're all looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> It, it's hard though. I mean, it, I agree. When you have it's a it when you're delivering bad news in person, like and sometimes that's the only way to deliver if you can. Uh, I mean, not pandemic notwithstanding, uh, it's there is a lot of stress that comes back at you, right? Yeah. As a presenter, and you're kind of if you're an empathetic person, you're feeling it for, Absolutely. and it's multiplied times however many people you have in the room, right? So that's that's a lot of weight on a creative director's shoulders to, to but. But yeah. to your point, you said this earlier, you got to be willing to, you, you said something different, but it's a, you know, you, you said deliver the bad news, right? Yeah. Because if you don't, you know, what happens, right? I mean, and as, as human beings, I think we're, we're normally pretty averse to conflict. And so yeah. we, we, and I'm going to say this personally, I, I don't, 
I think you are very good at delivering um, criticism that is direct and, and that, has been passed along. And I think that the, the people who are the best leads, managers, directors are the people who can do that, but do it in a way that's not demoralizing. It's not like you're going after people and saying, you're terrible. It's, it's um, let me just be blunt. Uh, you know, th- this thing that you're working on, let me point out some things that are great about it. But I also need to point out the parts that aren't living up to what you should be comfortable putting your name on. Yeah. And just saying that saves us so much time. Like I, I have wasted so much time over my career in every everything that I've ever done, uh, in not being direct, not yeah. you know letting letting it kind of slide and be like, oh, maybe it'll work itself out. It never works itself out. <laughs> what a great that's a great point. You're right. It doesn't. And it's funny. We we also I know you and I and others have talked about band aids. Right. Yeah. Sometimes the, just band aids aren't going to do it, and you really have to just go right in and, um, and rip that bandaid off and don't yeah. put any more on, fix the problem at its core. Uh, but, but rift apart, I mean, ultimately became, has become a game that has had a really positive reception and how have you, yeah. what, did you expect the reception that the game got? You know, I'm, I, again, I'm a very anxious person, so I'm always expecting the worst, um, I have worked on a lot of games that I've been very proud of that the critical reception ended up being less than what I thought it deserved uh, for for various reasons. So I knew the game was good. Uh, I knew it largely because my 11-year-old daughter, who's about to turn 12, was a usability tester. She played through the whole game without me saying anything. She was laughing at the right places. She was, you know, it it was working for her. And she's a cynical kid. Mm. I'll just put that out there. Um, and she loved. She she really really enjoyed the game and was able to follow the story and it just it. That's when I knew. Okay, if we're hitting, because I'm seeing developers play the game, I'm seeing adults play the game, I'm seeing Ratchet fans play the game. This is somebody who, the last time she played a Ratchet game was Ratchet PS4 when she was too young to remember it. So mm-hmm. she, it's not like she's ingrained in that whole backstory. And she got it. And she she was able to tell me at the end of every level what the story was about and. And again, laughing at the right places is always a big plus. But that's when I knew that 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 it was it it was headed in the right direction, um, and it really came down to the team knuckling down and polishing. And and again, hats off to this whole team. I think everybody. It really it's a cliche to say it's a labor of love, but this game really was a labor of love, especially working from home. How many uh, all the all the obstacles that we had over the last few years that made it difficult. And it was great to be able to focus our time and energy on something so positive. Yep. That, I, I will echo all of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I want to just shift over to just being a creative director in general. And, and and part of that is being creative. And one of the coolest you know, things I know about you is that you built your own house. <laughs> like, yeah. That is crazy. <laughs> Mind that blowing. Is, I agree. I agree. That was uh, that was a product of its times. It was it was when the housing market was insane, and uh, uh, my wife's parents had built their own house in the seventies or something up in the Bay Area, and so I, they kind of convinced us that it was easy, <laughs> which is foolish in retrospect. But at the time, it, it really was just there was no other option. Houses were insanely expensive, and uh, properties had not yet become crazy expensive. As we started looking and, and uh, putting offers down, it did get a little crazy expensive, but uh, we did we did pretty much everything wrong. Um, we, we bought a plot that had plans because the, the guy was a builder who was going to, but he had really, he was like a, a contractor. He wasn't an architect and his design was terrible. So uh, my wife, who really did do the bulk of the work, I'm, I was mostly just a guy who sweated a lot and carried things. Um, she taught herself AutoCAD and then, uh, so that she could modify the plans. And then she went to, to, uh, an architect who was like a friend of a friend just to kind of see those through and get a stamp or whatever. And she got so good at it. He hired her as a drafts person in the office. So for, for a while she was doing uh, blueprints uh, professionally because she picked this hobby up. Um, and then, yeah, we, it took us three years from the time we, we put the first shovel into the ground to the point where we moved in. And it was, uh, it was while we were, we started it during resistance, 
but it kind of went to hell and I had to become a lot more involved in between resistance and resistance two. And I think we moved in at the end of resistance two. <laughs> but you were, I mean, you were cutting wood, you're, you're putting, you're, you're creating the walls, you're you're pouring concrete, all that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Super, super involved. Uh, for the most of the house, it was my wife and I, and one carpenter and we would just come in every day and we would, I would be hammering, you know, nail guns. I don't, I don't deal with hammers. Those are, uh, that's smart. That's efficient. Yeah. It's efficient. Yeah. Uh, and, and then for specialty things, we would bring a crew in. So for example, we put flooring in and three guys came and did it in a day and a half. Mm. And I would probably still be doing it if it was up to me. Um, the drywall, same thing. Those, the people who do drywall professionally are wizards. I don't understand. I just choke on that dust all day. Huh. Yeah, it's definitely, I agree. There's so many parts of building a house that seem to be a, a dark art, but I, I hats off to you for, for taking it on. And, uh, and I think it just reflects, you know, your creative, you know, urges in general. I mean, you like making stuff, right? I mean, it, it's yeah. through and through. You know, it's funny that when we were about to, when we were endeavoring upon that, we went to our, get a loan and our loan officer, he sat us down in all seriousness. And he said, look, I've seen a lot of people get divorced over house building or renovations or anything. I'm just going to give you this one simple unsolicited bit of advice. Sometime uh, years from now, you two are going to get in a fight because he wants blue tile and you want green tile. And he goes, they're both fine. Just, <laughs> it's not worth it. Just pick one and move on. And I, I kind of I kind of get that. There were a few moments where I, I would turn to Sylvia, my wife, and say, this is a blue tile, green tile thing. Let's just let's just not get in a fight about it. <laughs> so if people listening need marriage counseling, clearly they should uh, email See their you. loan officer. Yeah, or talk to, <laughs> exactly. Talk to a loan officer. Uh, that's awesome. Well, I mean, taking it back into games, uh, what do you think are just a few key ingredients for any creative director in the in the AAA space? I'm, I say AAA space because, I, I mean, it, for somebody running a large team. Yeah. It's uh, always consider the end user is a big one because mm. so many times when we make decisions, it's based off of who is going to be working on it internally or what assets we have available or things like that. And at the end of the day, as a creative director, you need to be able to play the game that you're working on and divorce yourself from all of that knowledge and play it like you are a player and experience the things that are rough edges or aren't fitting right or are atonal. That's a, a huge one is, is just know what experience you're crafting. I, I can't tell you how many times we would have, um, even in Resistance 3, I remember there was a demo part that we showed in, at E3 where it's a run for your life segment where the player just needs to run. And just telling everybody, this is about getting the player from point A to point B in as spectacular a fashion as possible. Don't put anything interesting on this path. That's all. All we want to do here is invisible hand. We want lighting to tell the player where they need to go as the brightest spot on the screen so they know where to go. We want the music to be pumping. We want everything around you to be um, selling this idea that if you don't move forward, you are going to die. And the first second I ha we have something put up, some environment artist has put this really fascinating circus poster up on the wall. And, I, and you just have to go, wait, what, what were you talking about? <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's define your pillars, define your goals, your tonal goals uh, for everything that you're working on uh, at, a, at a pretty low level. And then just keep hitting people with it. Just make sure that everybody knows. Everybody knows, the, the composer knows, the, the audio designer knows, the environment artist knows, the UI. Uh, it, it, it goes a long way. And, and as we said before, having those really removes any sort of emotional response or I think it's cool or the worst criticism anybody can ever give in, in anything. It sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> it's not super helpful. No. <laughs> uh, has, has being a creative director changed you as a person? Yes. I, it's awful. All <laughs> I think I, my, my family is so tired of me complaining about bad design in life. Um, <laughs> I, I think back to when we were in the studio, the the bathrooms uh, at the studio, they have a faucet that sticks out 
But in order to activate the motion sensor, you had to put your hand so close to the edge that water just spilled over the top of the counter. So every time I walked into our bathroom, there was a janitor in there having to clean up this mess. And it was all because that, that design of that sink, of that faucet, was not thought out. That's the kind of thing that I do every day because I'm having to do that at work all the time. So my, my family is sick of it. I'm so sorry, Marcus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry for them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for those listening who are interested, would you, would you recommend being a creative director and taking that path? Uh, I recommend working with really creative collaborative problem solvers and whatever that position is, because I see creative direction uh, evolving as, you know, as we talked about our, at the beginning of the conversation, I didn't know what a creative director was. Uh, As we move forward, games are getting bigger and bigger and the ability for one human being to keep their eyes on every aspect of the game is just, it's not possible. And, and so I think as we move forward, we're just going to start to see a lot more, collaboration at an, at a directorial level, um, where, uh, you know, it's not tied to one person. I, I, I do not miss the days of being that one guy and, mm-hmm. and losing sleep over the fact that I am holding someone up because I forgot to do this because I got overwhelmed by this or, you know, um, and even just the, the sunset was the first time we had done a creative director, game director at insomniac in the studio. And just having another human being to talk to, to understand the inputs you're getting from everywhere, it's it's just good, healthy mental health to be able to have somebody that you can bounce off of. I feel like Drew and I were always just offset enough with our um, emotional well-being that if one of us was having a horrible day, the other one could pick up for them. And that goes a long, long way. That's a great commentary just on modern game development. I mean, it, it does... I mean, it does take a lot more than a village today to make Absolutely. these big games, but at all levels, right? It doesn't matter if you're uh, you're working on uh, assets, individual assets in the game, or you are working on the macro design or a director trying to help oversee everything. You need help. Everybody yeah. needs help. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and, and that's the thing I always talk to young developers about too, is when I started, I would bang my head against stuff and, and spend way too long instead of just asking for help. That... There is someone in the studio who will know how to do what you're wanting to do in a much faster, more efficient way. And so asking for help should never be seen as a weakness. And I I feel like as developers, maybe generations back, that was that was something we all struggled with. Yeah. Well, (laughs) it's it's so cool to see that these roles and these games and this process just continues to evolve it you know, this pace that never seems to slow down. Right. Yeah. And that, that's what I love about this, this gig is it's always different. I never yeah. really know what I'm going to be facing on the drive in. I, I have my, my set plans, but uh, things go awry and not even awry. Like they just change. Things yeah. change all the time. And and to me, I thrive in that. Um, I want to see change. I want to have change. Uh, I get, I get really tired easily. And this is not a position or a company that you get tired. It's it, things, things will surprise you. <laughs> no, no kidding. <laughs> well, Marcus, thank you so much for sharing all of that today. Really appreciate you, you being on. Thank you, Ted. I really appreciate it. And if I haven't said it enough, thank you for everything you've done in my career, because you're a, a really great example to developers out there. You're, oh. you just, you have respect for everybody and I hope that wears off on more of us. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for joining us for the Game Makers Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.